Welcome to the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival, one of the world's largest and oldest Jewish cultural arts events. We want to thank all our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education, SAGE, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all these years. My name is Sandra Lilienthal. I'm a faculty member of the SAGE Adult Learning Program, where I am currently teaching a course on the Book of Shemot, Exodus, and two courses on a melting curriculum that I authored, Oh My God and Members of the Tribe, which starts in a few weeks. I'm very excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with director Yaron Shani from the movie Reborn, which is premiering at this year's festival. Thank you all for joining us. Yaron, it's an honor to be here with you today. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you became a filmmaker? Wow. So I'll try to make it short because it's a very long story. I think I decided to become a filmmaker when I fell in love with a girl as a boy, as a young boy. And I felt like I need to be something, somebody very exceptional in order to from her to notice me and i think that something in the in the filmmaking in the cinema in the big screen something was there to to connect to this dream but when i went to learn to study filmmaking in the tel aviv university after three years of studying filmmaking which basically I was very successful in my studies and I felt like I'm on the right path. But as I was growing up and becoming more uh, and understanding life in a much more deep sense, I felt like uh, uh, filmmaking is not the, the thing for me. Mm. I felt like it's uh, a bit too superficial and entertaining and not something which is really worthwhile dedicating so much energy and life you know into so i decided to leave the cinema to the filmmaking but because i i had to make a, a thesis uh, film my diploma film I decided to make something very, quite crazy, very uh, experimental. So I was working with actors and non-actors and I was doing something which is somewhere in one leg in the reality and one leg in the fictional uh, world. And it, it overwhelmed me because it felt like I, I found something very exceptional, like a, a new tool to, exp to, to explore, explore life, to understand the human soul. So I decided to make at least one feature film, which was Ajami, uh, back uh, 10 days, 10 years ago. And that's it. Which was nominated for the Oscar, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Which was also a very, very, very low budget film, you know, mainly with non-professionals, something which was very, every, every expert in the, in the Israeli film industry told us that nobody, nobody is going to see this film. It was a big, big surprise to a lot of people, yeah. What, what really caught my attention watching Reborn was how natural all of the actors are. It's many times very difficult to tell when someone is acting and someone is not acting. And of course, the fact that you chose to shoot in actual places, the dementia um, um, hospital uh, makes a difference because the, the environment is real. But it goes much deeper than that. When uh, just citing one example, when I watched Yasmin, the teenage daughter, so both when she has a fight with Rashi, which any one of us who has ever seen a fight between a teenage girl and her father uh, or stepfather knows that that is exactly how it goes. And when she's cutting her mother's hair, I mean, it is so natural. And I understand that this is exactly your stamp on directing. So talk a little bit about how you cast 
and, and how you end up with these people who are really not actors, even though they're acting. Yeah, so when we say they are acting, it's we need to be accurate because it's not like when professional actors act. Because what professional actors know is how to perform. Uh, they are given a, a text, they are giving a script, and they are making rehearsals, and they are trying their best to, to perform as if uh, the, as authentic as possible. Authenticity in fictional cinema is something which is very precious because it's very hard uh, to provide something which is very authentic. That's why also uh, fictional cinema tends to go to the other side, to the to the less authentic places. You know, more entertaining. Uh, grandiose, uh, exceptional, very, very strange, uh, very stylish, very beautified uh, vision of life. What I found out is that we have the talent as human beings to play roles. This is what we do when we are in the kindergarten. You know, you, you watch the kids and they are playing family. And they are not really a husband and wife and kids and, and, and the baby. They are playing a role and it's open, it's free, and they explore life through this playing. So it's not really acting, it's playing. This is what I'm doing with adults. I'm providing them with, a, a, with the opportunity to, to become somebody else, to live the life of somebody else and to feel free to express themselves in a way that in their genuine life they would never do in front of a camera, of course. So that like, for example, a 13 year old girl, she will act in a certain way in her private home, but she would never let anyone else see it. But here, it's she's free to express herself, to let out things that are very, very they are in her unconscious, you know. They are something that is not it's not public, but through the character and the fact that she's not acting something, she's not performing, she's reacting and behaving freely to the situation which is alive. It's not scripted, and we are observing it. I'm observing it as a director. My my goal is not to tell them what to say and how to behave. My goal is to give them the, the, uh, the ground, the best environments so that they will be in it totally or as much as possible, you know, in the moment and to observe it in, in the most sensitive way. So it's a, it's a new thing. It's not something that, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting and I'm, exploring it while I'm doing it. And it's fascinating in terms of psychology to see how we can be somebody else and, and we can choose to go back to our identity and go back to, the, to another personality and to live through different personalities in our lives. But this is a, a whole different discussion. So how do you cast? How, how do you choose the people you're going to work with? Well, I'm first of all, when I write the initial idea, I'm, I'm, I'm making a very big research about the subject. For example, if you see in Reborn, I'm dealing with uh, prostitution and uh, sexual, uh, sexual harassment and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm really, really going down and really becoming a very, an expert in the psychological aspects and the political aspects and philosophical aspects. And, the, and I'm, get, I'm getting to know a lot of people who are in this reality. So while I'm doing it, I'm, I'm finding these unique people and they, and after I find them, they basically 
uh, design the, the plot, they design the characters, they don't know it, they are not aware of it. But as I'm working with them and I watch them, I understand who is Abigail, who is Yael, who is Nama, I, they show me the characters. So it's a two-way casting, you know. And you give them a general idea of what you're thinking, but there is no script. So you can end up with something that is different from what you originally had planned. Is that correct? Well, 99% of what we have is different, but it's different in a, in a good sense because it's like reality is much more, it's much deeper and much stronger than anything that I can imagine. So I'm always surprised, but I'm like, wow, I didn't expect that, you know. Wow, this is so complicated. I would never have imagined it. I have to, to put a, an exception here because if we get to a point that things become a bit dangerous, sexually or physically, then we stop. And then we make things very, very, very accurate, of course, like an ordinary filmmaking in order for everybody to know exactly what is going to happen and how they are going to do it. And so in, in all the other areas, we are letting them be free to cry, to laugh. That means that if somebody cries, it's not because it's written in the script. They don't know that they are supposed to cry. They just feel like crying, you know? So it's a, it's a different kind of authenticity. It's not realism because it's not a style. It's not, I'm not trying to, to show things in a realistic manner. I'm, I'm really observing something which happens by itself, but it's not reality. You understand? It's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. Thank you. So Reborn is the last film of your trilogy. Um, tell us, how do you see the overall messages of the trilogy and how Reborn fits into this big picture? Well, as, I, as I'm working with the human soul a lot, what fascinates me most is the paradoxical nature of life. The, the, the fact that somebody who is apparently very afraid on other circumstances, he would be very brave. And someone who is uh, in certain times, he's very cheap. In other times, he would be very, very uh, open. So it's like, so this is something that is really interesting for me and especially of course love as a, as a subject of, of trying to, to observe love. What is love? Love is a very, very complicated notion and it's, uh, it has so many contradictions within itself. Like for example, if we want, the, the more intimate we want to become, the more exposed we need to be and it's more dangerous for us. And that's why you, we see people who get divorced become uh, worst enemies. And also, for example, if we become, if you and I are in a relationship, one of my biggest fears is that you will change. Mm -hmm. Maybe something will happen to you, or or you will change, and it will affect me because I'm I'm so dependent on you because I love you so much. And this dependency, most of the times, it builds some kind of uh, tactics of control that I'm trying to control your life in order to make you safe or to make you mine, you know, so you will not change, you will not surprise me in a bad way. And so my love, my love can become very bad in, in certain terms. So this is something that I, was, I, I wanted to explore in this, with this tool, you know, to let people become in, in, in relationships and to see how they react in certain situations, uh, to see how a very, very strong intimacy in life can build a lot of uh, violence. Um, 
so I guess the 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 main frame of the project is love, the nature of love. And yet, at least in Reborn, you address different kinds of love, not just a husband wife. That is a minor part of it. In fact, most of the characters, the important characters are all women. Uh, Rashi is the only male character and is really a supporting character, not the most important part of the story. Um, what led you to, to choose to make a, a movie where basically it's all about women's relationships? Yes. You know, one of the things that is very interesting is that, you know, if there is an experiment where people are left with a baby all, all by themselves, and they don't know that somebody is watching them with a camera and they made it with a lot, a lot of people. I don't know, thousands of people. And do you know what most of them did? No. They checked if it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> so they were not, play, some were playing with the baby, some were like uh, indifferent to the baby. But almost all of them wanted to check if it's a boy or a girl. How interesting. This, this concept that it's something very deep within us to understand who you are. Are you a woman or a man? Are you masculine or feminine? This is what, something which is very, very strong in our uh, nature, I would say. And also in, in culture, of course. So femininity and masculinity is a big part of love, not only between men and women, also in terms of motherhood. You know, becoming a mother, which is maybe one of the most profound stages that you can take as a human being to become a mother, also to become a father. Um, I found out it wasn't my attention because I my first intention was to make one single feature length film with a lot of stories in it, like a, a mosaic plot with a lot of characters in it. But when I was working, it became something different. It became much deeper, much larger. So I decided to, to to cut it into three separate films that make together something new, like a, like a series series of of uh, of uh, cinema movies. And the characters guess, are the same, Yaron. Yes, they all well, show up in different ways. If you if you remember, there's a a woman in the in the ending of uh, Reborn. She hugs Nama and tells her that she is not alone. That's the main character in, in, an, in another movie. Got it. And Rashi, who is the husband of Abigail, is a main character in, in, it, in, the, second. in the second movie. So basically, these three films are, I found out later that uh, Reborn is made basically about maternal love, mostly. It's about the, the something which is very feminine, you know, it, it's, uh, it's like uh, taking care of somebody else or losing yourself in order to provide for somebody else and, and becoming a mother and taking care of others. And, and it's also paradoxical because sometimes, many times when you do it, you are becoming like, uh, you know, the term of uh, Freud who said uh, that the devouring mother. Mm -hmm. When you give, you also take. Yeah. When you give, you provide to your child, you also take charge of it and you, you don't let it become independent. So it's a complicated notion. And I was trying to explore it. And I think one of the things that we see throughout Reborn is how the relationships, the, the specific one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, they have role reversals throughout the movie how sometimes the person that is the comforter becomes the comforted, right? At a different point. And which is beautiful because 
that is what happens in friendships that sometimes you are the most vulnerable one and other times the other person is vulnerable and that's beautiful um can we talk about the importance of hair whether it is the braids that represent how tight Abigail is uh, until she finally lets her hair go or when she decides to cut her hair which is a beautiful beautiful scene um sort of letting go of all the weights in in her life why did you choose hair as the symbolism mm. well i guess it, it wasn't me i'm i'm that i'm not that uh, I did. Th I didn't think about the hair until I, I I worked on the film, and somehow the notion of hair in different dimensions and the importance of hair in people's lives it it just came out. You no, know, because the actress who who played Avigail she had a very very long hair which is something that was part of her identity. Mm -hmm. And she, of course, somebody who worked, I think that everyone has an issue with, with hair, you know, either it's on the face or on the head or on the body. It's like hair is something, it's, it has some kind of a mystical power, you know, it's it's part of us, it's, it's a big, 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 thing within us. And uh, uh, the, the actress, uh, her name is Stav. Stav in Hebrew means Otham. So Stav who played uh, Abigail, she had her personal issues with hair. And I was lucky enough for her to, to bring it into the character. She wanted to cut her hair as the character. If you if you will see a, a chains, which is another part of the trilogy where Rashi is the main character, you would see that Rashi falls into a, a crisis. Part of it because his wife is leaving him, and he grows his beard. And in one of the scenes, I show a picture in his childhood room where you see Samson from the Bible. And Samson has an issue with his hair. It's like uh, the hair of Samson is something very interesting. And, and basically, I, I understood that there's something about hair. You know, we grow hair when we mourn. And we, we today we want to, to remove all the hair that we have on the body because we want to be children. We want to look like children. And hair for women is part of the identity of the femininity of sexual uh, image. So it was really interesting for me. I think not only hair, also water. Yes. Purity, water and purity it's, is something very that came out while we were working. I, I, I find, found out that water is something very, very uh, has a deep meaning for us as human beings. So it's interesting because as you were saying this, I was thinking, yes, um, the hair, Jewishly speaking, um, as you mentioned, uh, Samson, and you mentioned the letting hair grow when you're in mourning. Um, there's also the idea that you don't cut the corners of the hair. So people, men who, who let their hair grow and, and have peyot and um, women covering their hair after they are married. So there, there's a lot about uh, hair in Jewish tradition. As you now mentioned water, there's also a lot about water in the Jewish tradition and the whole idea of going to the mikvah, whether men or women. Um, and it leads me to a question. When I was watching Reborn, I was thinking, what is Jewish about this movie? What is Israeli about this movie? Meaning, could a movie like this have been made in uh, France by a Christian director, right? Um, and I think I know my answer, but I'd like to hear your answer to that question. Well, I, I'm very curious about your answer, I have to say, because for a, I, I'm 100% Israeli. So it's very hard for me to imagine somebody else making it. It's a very universal story. 
It's not something that is, uh, it's, the, all the characters in the movie are secular, they are very Western uh, oriented, and it's not like uh, the ethnic or the religious identity is not very strong there. It's not about that. It's about the more um, uh, fundamental uh, layers of, of identity. So I guess it could happen in other places, but I'm pretty sure that there's something about my and the, ac the, the, the people in this project uh, the fact that we are Israelis gives something. I would very much want to hear your opinion, but I have to add something, two things. I think that if I worked in the American industry, I would never be allowed to make Ajami. I think that the fact that the Israeli industry is so, how should I say it, without, uh, without, uh, giving a, a bad reputation to the Israeli industry. It's very, very small. It's very young. So I guess this enabled me to, to do something which is completely crazy. You know, Ajami was totally nuts. And this project is also very, very uh, strange and experimental. So I guess this is one thing that the Israeli our Israeli identity helped us. Another thing which was very interesting, the premiere, the world premiere of a Ribbon was in uh, Busan in uh, North, in South Korea. And that for me was really, really overwhelming experience because I found myself after the screening standing like an hour and a half with I think they're like 30, 40 South Koreans and elderly women also. And they were crying and they were talking a lot about things that felt for them so outrageous, so out of reality that they wanted to explore, to try also to do it like the, the gathering of the women, you know, uh, it felt for them, wow, this is so not us so not South Korean. So I was, I, I'm very clear, curious how other people might perceive this movie. So my, my, when I was watching the movie, what I felt is first of all, it is infused with Jewish concepts, even though there's nothing Jewish about the movie. But as we mentioned, the hair and the water and even the sisterhood, right? You mentioned now that South Korea, the women said, that's not something that is part of our lives. Um, the idea of sisterhood in Judaism is very strong. Um, and I think that is something that I saw in the movie. I also, you know, you do give an, a very clear Israeli mark to the movie when you have the siren uh, and everybody stops. And one of the things that to me was so moving, I am very used to seeing scenes of the siren talk and everybody opens the door of their car, gets out and stops. And yet I had never imagined or thought about what happens when a man and a woman are together in a room and the siren rings. And to me, that was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. So there, there is that mark and the movie could have been made without that scene, um, but you added it. So there, there is that, that Israeli mark. Um, I don't think that the movie having been made in a different country um, and by a non-Jewish, um, director would have had the same results, even though, as you say, this is a movie about the human soul and the human soul, there is no difference in human souls between nationalities, ethnicities, women are women, men are men, people are people, and the issues would have been exactly alike. But even I wonder, for example, if it, if it had been made with Palestinian women, which Israeli, but Palestinian women with a different view of the world, if that would have made a difference. And I believe, yes, it would. It, it would have been slightly different as well. So why don't you tell us about a few challenges that you confronted in making the film? I imagine one was raising money, um, but what, what were the challenges that you had to confront? Well, I think my... 
my main challenge, first of all, was to to try and to uh, to make the professional people work the way I needed them to work. That was really, really difficult because the professional people, the smart people, the experts, they are very stupid in, in certain terms because they know how to do things. Mm -hmm. And so they are very narrow-minded. And if you're trying to, to take them out of their box, it's, they are very, very violent against it. It's very hard to, to ask a football player to become a tennis player because it's like, who cares about tennis? So it was very hard for me to make, to be, with the non-professional people, it was amazing for me to work with the professional people. And, and I do need them because, you know, we need, you need a camera we need sound, we need production, we need everything. So that was really hard. Uh, I think the second thing was emotionally, you know, the, the fact that I'm, I'm, I feel responsible for the well-being of all the, the people who joined me. And I'm talking about 300 people wow. that I got to know very, very closely. Most of them we are still in, in, in connection with, you know, we, it's, four years ago already. And, and we became like family members in certain terms. So it, for me, it was really a big concern uh, to try to make this experience the most, maybe I was trying to make, to give them a gift, to give them some kind of a, 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 a profound present for life, something that they will not be able to experience in any other way. And I feel that mostly it's a success, mostly, I would say. Have any of them continued, um, the actors? No. Have many of them continued making movies or no? This was their, their experience. Well, Rashi, who was uh, the main actor in the in another movie? You saw him a little bit in Reborn. He got the the best actor uh, award in the in the Israeli Oscar. So he got a lot of attention. He got a lot of uh, people wanted him for films, and he did some minor things. But I don't think he's not an actor, so I don't think he will continue, and he doesn't need to. He was a, he was a retired police officer, right? Yeah, of okay. course. He also act, uh, he was in Ajami. That's where I I mm. found him. That's where I got to know him. And uh, Lalif Sivan, who plays the woman in the end of Reborn, she's hugging Nama, who is the main actress in. Uh, uh, in in the in the third movie, uh, stripped. Mm -hmm. She also uh, she has an agency. She started to direct films because she she came from the industry. She was a first uh, assistant director in in a lot of series and movies. She learned filmmaking, and now she is trying. She's she has become a director, and she is also acting a bit. But that's it. One thing that I want to, to bring up in terms of the movie, the opening of the movie the, in the beginning, you touch on a very important topic that I think affects every single person, which is how to make end of life decisions and how the siblings have different understandings of what needs to be done not because one is a nice person and the other one is not, but there are different personalities. Uh, what, what should you do when an elderly parent that is very ill? And even though that is not the main issue of the movie, I do believe that that brings the topic to conversation uh, among people in the world today. And it's very common to see these different, you know, siblings with different ideas on how to handle shocking going against each other at a time when everybody needs each other 
and you don't need to be fighting. But it is a very common thing. And I think you have a whole nother movie right there if you ever want to, um, to do something on this. It's also a, a different movie. Um, can you explain your choice on how to end the movie? Because the end is, is abrupt, right? Why did you choose that ending? Well, I think one of the uh, things that I, I found out later after making this project is that uh, when I decided to go into the tragic aspect of life, of relationships, uh, into the pain and to do it as much as authentic as possible. Um, I didn't realize how deep I went. And uh, some, I think that something in me, some kind of uh, guts feeling told me that I need to finish with hope. And so I, I understood that um, I need to connect the character from one film who goes through a crisis in her own life with another character who goes through a major crisis in hers and to connect them in a very, very uh, gracious moment. And for me, this ending is, says that although life is can become terrible. Life can become really brutal. We together, we can make it worthwhile. You know, there's meaning in love and we can find a meaning to life through the pain together. So this is something I tried to do. I don't know if many people got it. What I find fascinating is that you just used the words tragedy and hope in the exact same way that the biblical prophets did, right? The prophet was always a person that would speak about all of the destruction and all the pain and all of that, and yet offer the hope for a better future. So even in that, there is such a Jewish underlying in that ending, even though it is nowhere explicit, but it's the idea that you know, we have been through so much pain and there always is a possibility of coming out on the other side with all of the pain, not, you can't forget it, but you can get out of that terrible moment or moments that you've been going through. That's amazing. I so, say, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, well, I, I find the Bible really, really something which is really... Uh, which says much more than that. I think that not only the Bible, also the, the Far East uh, philosophy shows us that without the pain, without the destruction, there is no hope. Mm -hmm. That's the paradox of life. If we don't feel, uh, if we are not deprived of food, if we don't feel that we need, that we are, our survival is threatened. We don't understand what is how amazing life is that we can breathe, that we can eat. If we get it very easily, we lose the meaning of it. So destruction is a very, very important part of life. And every story is about a crisis, is about a crisis that we learn from. And every character has her own crisis. Yeah. In Reborn. And every one of us, we all get, go through hell in order to get, get a glimpse of paradise sometimes. I love it. I, I'm very much looking forward myself to watching the other two movies that I had not seen. Um, Reborn was very special to me. It really, there are scenes there that are profoundly emotional. Um, and I want to thank you, Yaron Shani, director of the movie Reborn, for joining us. Once again, thank you to all our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all these years. 
Thank you, our audience, for participating in the 24th Annual Miami Jewish Film Festival.